Galatians chapter 4, while you turn there, I have a big announcement, big announcement. We have a wedding coming up, February the 22nd, Al and Dee are getting married, yay! It wasn't my fault. Amen. Amen. So, yeah, they came and told me about it last Sunday morning. I was tickled to death for them. I really was. So, uh, let's see, that's February 22nd. That's a Saturday at 2 o'clock. And uh, so everybody's invited. Come out and uh, join with them as they join themselves together. Cute couple. Cute couple. Galatians chapter 4, we are studying uh, typology. Now, um, as we're doing this, I'm going to give everybody a test. I'm going to pick a story out of the Bible and we're going to see what you've learned so far about the language of typology. We're going to see what it is that you can pick out of that story that you think shows, first of all, typology shows us it is a picture of a doctrine or a prophecy of some kind. So, during the course of this lesson, maybe next Sunday too, I'll maybe give a, just a story at random, and we'll see if you can pick out the characters, what they represent, what it means, maybe as far as doctrine is concerned, or prophecy is concerned, so on. We're going to play stump the jurors, and then you get to play stump the teacher. Okay? You pick a story and give it to me, and we'll, we'll see if I can figure it out, all right? Which, if you don't know the answer to it, I can make it any of it up, and you wouldn't know the difference anyway. So, Gal Galatians 4.21. I mean, I, I could lie just like Democrats can in impeachment hearings. Right? Galatians 4.21. Uh, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law... Do you not hear the law, for it is written for eight, that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman? Notice you have two women, two sons, two men, one father. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was, born, was by promise, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. And, and, and again, the Bible always tells you the meaning of it. If the Bible gives you a type or a shadow or a story or an allegory or whatever, then the Bible is going to give you, somehow, someway, it's going to relate to you the meaning of it. For this Agar, Hagar, is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren, thou bear, that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was. There's that word, as. That's what I told you last Sunday. One of the most important words in understanding the Bible is the word as. As this is that, so on. As Isaac was, uh, are the children of promise. So, we looked at the words in samples. If you look up on the screen, in samples, examples, example, um, Jude, and an example, 1 Peter, the like figure, uh, Romans 5.14, I'm not sure if we read this verse or not, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses 
Adam is a type. He is a, uh, a foreshadowing of the second Adam, who is Christ. And, you know, th think about this for a minute. It was... The, the bride was taken from Adam. The, the church, we are of Christ. Adam was put to sleep. Sleep is a symbol of death in the Bible. They shall sleep the sleep of death, the Bible says. So Adam was put into a deep sleep. It's like when Christ died. It was a wound in Adam's side that God used to, to make his bride. It was a wound in Christ's side, which is where the blood flowed, which brings about the church and so on. It was God bringing the bride to Adam, Eve, bringing Eve to Adam. So shall it be at the rapture. God will bring the bride to Jesus to meet Jesus in the air. So, uh, Romans 5, 14 again. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So the word figure, a prefiguring, is, is a word that we use. This is prefigured in, we'll say, Moses, or prefigured in Noah, or so on and so forth. Turn to, um, turn to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 8. Uh, make, have covered... Part of this last Sunday morning, but if you don't remember what I talked about last Sunday, then I don't either. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5. In fact, let's go back to... Ooh, I like this. I like this. Go back to verse 1 of Hebrews 8. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum... I like Paul. Paul was a Paul's lawyer. Paul is always acting like a lawyer in a courtroom. And lawyers give summations. At the end of a trial, the lawyers then will stand up and give a summation of all the evidence that they have brought forth. They will point out the weaknesses in the in the other parts. Um, evidence or whatever and then they will give the strength of their argument it's called a summation and Paul's all the time saying what shall we say to these things what what more shall we say or what what is the sum of these things now these things of which we have spoken this is the sum we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not Man, and understand this, there's been this discussion amongst those who studied Bible prophecy for years that they're going to rebuild a temple in Jerusalem. Now, I don't know if they are or not, but I'll tell you, if they do, Christ won't dwell in it. Because it was made by the hands of man. And God does not dwell in temples made with hands. So, who pitched Moses' tabernacle? Moses did. And so, the Lord will build. Remember what he told, remember what he told them when they showed him the temple in Jesus' day? They said, see all these, oh look, Jesus, look at this great temple. Jesus said, destroy this temple, and I will rebuild it in three days. I'll do it. And of course, they laughed at him. They said, what, 46 years we spent building this temple. You're going to build it in three days? But they wist not that he spoke of the temple of his body. So the Lord, e even the body is typology. The body, the body itself. Um, I've talked about this before. Your 24 ribs surrounding, going all the way around. Those are the 24 elders in Revelation 4, surrounding the throne of God. The heart is the, the throne of God with the four living creatures. The four chambers of the heart are the four living creatures. Your two lungs, they have seven partitions to them. Those are the seven spirits of God. The, the fact that there's two lungs means it's Old and New Testament together. 
lungs of the spirit, the breath, the pneuma. Um, so literally, your whole body is the temple of God. It's not that God designed our bodies after the temple. He designed the temple after our body, okay? And so even our body is a type, a shadow of the Lord's house. Um, so anyway, who is serving the example and shadow of heavenly things. And, um, anyway, I'm, I'm back here in uh, Hebrews uh, verse 2. The true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Verse 3. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. He's talking about Christ. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. Now again, he brings in this word shadow. A shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make that tabernacle, for see, saith he, thou, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee, in the mount, but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by, uh, uh, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there should no place have been sought for the second. So the first covenant, it's the old covenant, the Old Testament, the law given to Mount, at Mount Sinai, the fault in that law was not that God wrote it wrong. The fault in that law was that it was based upon man's ability to do right. And man doesn't have the ability to do right. So that was the fault in the old law. Except Christ comes, fulfills that law by being the only one to ever not break that law. Now Christ becomes the mediator of a better covenant. So the first covenant was a foreshadowing and a type of the second covenant. The lesser being a shadow. And it uses the word shadow. So I don't know if you can see it, but on the floor is my shadow. If you were to come and say, I'm going to go talk to Mike. You don't look at my shadow and start talking to it. Because that's not the real me. The real me is up here. That's my shadow. And you'll see the Bible later on that the shadow is not the real. We tend to get this idea that the word spiritual in the Bible means not real not genuine, not tangible. But the truth of it is, our spiritual man is more real than this flesh that houses it. Our inner man and the angels of heaven and God and the Spirit are more real than we are. Uh, James 5.10, Take my brethren the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Uh, was having lunch with my mom one time and she uh, was teaching a Sunday school lesson and I was out of this, the life and story of David, I think. And she asked me, she said, why do you think God allowed David to go through all these terrible things? You know, to have, you know, Saul try to kill him all the time. Um, to commit adultery and then try to have the man killed over it. And then the baby died. And she said, why do you think God allowed David to go through all these things? I said, well, Mom, you're reading about him, aren't you? She said, yeah. And I said, that's why. I said, David was a person just like you and I are. The Bible says concerning Elijah, Elijah was a man of like passions as we. And yet here is this man of like passions who prayed one time and it didn't rain for three and a half years. He prays again and it rains. 
okay? This one man, even though the prophets of Baal have been screaming at Baal all morning, cutting themselves, dancing up and down, hooping and hollering and everything else, can't get Baal to send fire down from heaven, and yet this one man prayed one time. And out of that one prayer, fire came down from heaven. Here's Jesus, the man of suffering, the God who created everything, who certainly did have the power. You know, they uh, tempted him and said, why don't you ask the angels to come and, and save you? Jesus didn't need angels to save him. He's God. He could have popped those nails off himself. He could have, he could have uncreated the cross. He could have done whatever he wanted to. Okay? But he set forth as our example that if Christ can suffer, who are we? That day that I got stranded uh, and wasn't able to go to Kenya, had me and my wife and Alicia and her two kids at the airport, St. Louis Airport, and we got turned away right then and there when they told us, your kids cannot get on the plane, we can't let them out of the country because their passports expire too soon. And we went, what? I said, yeah, they, they, the kids' passports expire in six months, or in less than six months, and as such, they cannot leave the country in case something happens, they, they can't leave the country, because it's harder I won't get into all of it, but anyway, so here we are, had my heart set on going to Kenya, and Alicia said, Dad, while we're at the airport, Dad, you can go, why don't you go and leave us here? And I said, I'm not going to leave my wife here again after what I went through last time, I'm not doing it. So we called Lindsay, had her come pick us up again, and we took off. And Lisa and I are driving around town, and this is after the, the plane has already left. And I slammed my hand on the steering wheel, scared Lisa to death. She said, what? And I said, I just remembered that those pastors from Samburu were going to travel all the way to Nairobi because they had a gift for me. And it made me mad. And I said, why didn't I remember that at the airport? Had I remembered that at the airport, I would have got on that plane. And then I asked, started asking the question, God, why didn't you let me remember that at the airport? And God said, because you'd have got on the plane. And for some reason, it was not for me to get on that plane. Or I'd have got on it. So that night, I'm, we decided to go on a vacation. And I'm just, we're in Memphis, Tennessee, and I'm struggling. And I'm just, God, why didn't you... How could this happen? And God reminded me of the story of how the Apostle Paul, Satan hindered him from going and preaching in a certain place. And it was like, Paul's the example. Mike, if Satan can hinder Paul, who are you? I went, yeah, that's true. All the, if you want to take typology and just make it a personal application, all of these people in this Bible go through things that you either have gone through or are going through now or will go through. They are all examples to us of what happens when normal people run into normal circumstances the devil works against them, stands against them, causes affliction. Sometimes we, ha we have people in the Bible who represent us who've done something wrong and God punishes them for it and then brings them out at the end of it much better than they ever were. Those people are our examples. But then we have people in the Bible who did nothing wrong, suffer, and yet through that suffering, end up praising God all the way through. Those are our examples as well. Think of Job. Why did God, why did God allow Job to be afflicted the way he was? He didn't do anything wrong. All three of his friends agreed that Job had done something wrong, but Job knew his heart. He didn't do anything wrong. Why did God let him do it? 
Why did God let him go through it? Same reason you and I go through stuff. There's a devil out there. He hates us all. And we're going to have to endure hardship. Some people ask me, why does God allow innocent people to suffer? Well, he allowed Jesus to suffer, and Jesus didn't do anything. To any, first of all, none of us are innocent. But God allowed Jesus to suffer. He never did anything wrong. It's part of this life. And it's part of the reason why I want less of this world and more of the world to come. Somebody say amen. Um, 1 Peter 2.21. Turn to 1 Peter. Just a couple pages over from Hebrews and James and so on. 1 Peter 2. Verse 19. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if, when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if, when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable unto God, or acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who in here has ever read a book called In His Footsteps? Or In His Steps or In His Footsteps? You read that? Betty, you read that? Melissa, do you remember, we, I don't remember what pastor it was when we were growing up, but he was encouraging everybody in this church to read that book. Might have been Brother Sherry or somebody like that. But anyway, outstanding book. It's a whole it's a story of a whole town who decides that in every decision they make, they're going to ask the question, what would Jesus do? In his footsteps. And that's where that comes from. Uh, yeah, verse 21. For even here unto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. And see, I'm the exact opposite of that. I'm especially, especially when I'm driving, I think everybody should get what they got coming while I'm driving a car. I think I should be allowed to run over everybody who deserves it. Amen. At least I'm not alone. Turn to Colossians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. Ooh, I want to go, I want to go to uh, verse 13. Verse 13, Colossians 2, And you being dead in your sins uh, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, which means made alive, together with him, having forgiven you, how many trespasses? All. Don't believe the Catholic Church telling you you're only partially forgiven. That's a lie. Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Don't believe Ellen White, founder of the Jehovah, uh, not Jehovah's Witness, Seventh-day Adventist, who says, get this now, got a guy that his family, they're watching right now. They, this guy used to be a Seventh-day Adventist, had bought all their books, Ellen White's books, everything, and he sent me the goods on her. I did not know this. Ellen White claimed that an angel came, transported her to heaven. She sees on this wall in heaven the Ten Commandments written with the finger of God, blaze glory coming out of the Ten Commandments, with the Fourth Commandment shining brighter than the other nine commandments. 
The fourth commandment is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And the angel tells Ellen that while Christ died and blotted out the handwriting of the ordinances of nine of the commandments, the fourth commandment must still be followed. What did Paul say? Though we or an angel from heaven bring you any other gospel, let him be accursed. And one thing I noticed going through Kenya, Seventh-day Adventists have a very firm grip in Kenya. They got churches everywhere in Kenya. Everywhere. But that's not what it says. It says, verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Doesn't say that there was one left. Says all of them. Verse 15, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And what, now let me tell you what that means. What that means is that Christ made a display of his enemies while he was on the cross. The enemies of sin. He had a crown of thorns on his head. Thorns is representation of, number one, the curse of sin, because that's what was given to Adam. Number two, thorns sting, so it represents the sting of death. And it was a crown, which means it rules and reigns over us. That's what that means. Okay? Christ was naked, which means he bore our shame to to the cross, nailed our shame to the cross, taking our shame away from us on the cross. Amen. Okay? Now, I'm going to throw in a theory that I have. It's a theory. Okay? I believe Christ was the Nazarite. The Nazarite. I believe he took, I believe on him was a Nazarite vow from his birth. That's why I believe this. Number one. Um, It says, uh, I can't remember the verse. Uh, something about him coming out of Nazareth or something like that. But the only place that that matches is that when it was spoken of Samson, he shall be a Nazarite from birth. Number two, what was it about a Nazarite that they were to never do? Cut their hair. Okay? Now, some people have a problem with this because they say it's a sin for a man to have long hair. That's not what the scripture says. Is a shame for a man to have long hair. Okay? But I want you to think about this. In Revelation 9, the devils that come up out of the pit, they have the face of a man and the hair of a woman. And I think Christ is making a show of them while he's on the cross, having the face of a man and long hair of a woman. And he's nailing them in a type to his cross. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, again, it could be wrong on that one. And I've, had, I've mentioned that before and had some people give me some legitimate scriptural arguments why they don't believe that, and I'm fine with that, okay? But that's just my little theory. But we know that, hang on, David, I'll get to you in a minute. We know that Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Does that mean Christ is the devil? No, but he's making a show of our enemy, the devil, on the cross being lifted up. Okay, David. Yeah. Yeah, comes from the, yeah, I get, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. But he says, um, 
having spoiled principal verse 15, principalities and powers, which are devils, it's what we're wrestling against. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In other words, he took on, he was a representation of all of our enemies, and he nailed in, in a type all of our enemies to his cross so that when he died, they died. Okay? It's like Samson who says, let me die with the Philistines. The Bible says he took more of his, he killed more of his enemies in his death than he ever did in his life. And some people say, well, he committed suicide. No, he didn't commit a suicide. You were in Nam, right? Okay. Had, did you hear stories of guys who gave their lives to protect their fellow soldiers? Did you ever think that was suicide? No. That's a soldier's honor. A soldier's honor is to put his life for the life of his fellow soldiers. Amen? And especially if it's your commanding officer, shoot, I'd follow that guy to the grave. Okay? And that's, anyway. So that's what Christ did. He made a show of his enemies openly. And then he said, verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or a new moon, or of any Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So what do you say? Again, it's like I said a while ago. Here's me, here's my shadow, which is the real me. This, not the shadow. And you have these Sabbath keepers, and you have these feast day keepers who really think they're putting on a show for God. Oh, we're honoring God because we keep the feast days. We keep the Sabbath days. And the Bible says that that was the shadow. That wasn't the real. You know who, you know what our Passover is? Christ. He is our Passover. So which would you rather have? Which would you rather eat? The shadow of a sandwich or a sandwich? Amen. <laughs> Unless the person's a lousy cook. <laughs> I'll just eat the shadow, thank you. <laughs> uh, turn to uh, Hebrews, oh, turn to Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8. So while you're turning there, I, okay, I said I was going to do this. Hebrews 8. Let me give you, let me see if I can give you a good story here. Um, let me think of a, a typology story here. Abraham... This is an easy one. Abraham taking Isaac to Mount Moriah. What is that a type of? You got to know the story first. Huh? Okay. Right. Right. Because God said, take thine only son. And Mount Moriah just happens to be the exact place where Golgotha is. Exact place. Yeah. Yeah, he was, he was no kid. Okay. But it, it, I, and I love the King James on this. King James, when, when Isaac says... You know, where's, this, uh, where's the lamb for sacrifice? Abraham says, God will provide himself a lamb. And he did. He provided himself the lamb. Okay? So that, and that's an easy one. Um, let's see here. Joshua and Jericho. 
Joshua and Jericho. That's a type of something. What is it a typology of? Joshua and Jericho. Joshua fits the ja battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fits the battle of Jericho, and the wall came tumbling down. Oh, that's an easy one. What happened to Jericho? Right. That's good, yeah. Yeah. What were they doing while they were walking around seven times? Huh? Nope. How many trumpets? It's a typology, it's a prophecy. Okay. And let's see what else. So they and actually they marched around 13 times. One time a day for six days, seven times on the seventh day, and they blew seven trumpets. The seven trumpets are the seven trumpets of Revelation, chapter 8 and 9. Okay? And Jericho fell, Babylon. Jericho is Babylon, which Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Okay? So that's that's uh, did that bell ring? I didn't hear it, so it doesn't count. Uh, where did I tell you to turn to? Hebrews 8? Very quickly, Hebrews 8. Let's go to verse 3. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. Did I just read that? No. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing there are priests that offer gifts according to the law who serve unto an example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern, pattern is another word, showed to thee uh, in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how, uh, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. You have all this, you have these words better, better, better. The shadow is one thing. The real is better. The Old Testament is good. New Testament is better. And so the Old Testament tabernacle was merely a shadow of the New Testament tabernacle. The New Testament tabernacle is in heaven. The Ark of the Covenant, which... For some reason, after the days, we have, a, we have a record in the days of Josiah of the Ark of the Covenant being in the temple, and after the days of Josiah, it disappeared. Not even Steven Spielberg knows where it is. Okay? It's gone. Why? Because that Ark has animal blood on it. The one in heaven has Christ's eternal blood on it. That's the, and, and the one on earth, I mean, the one on earth may have been stolen. It may have been, I don't know, may have been destroyed. Somebody may have pulled the gold off of it or whatever. So, who knows what happened to it? That's just the point. It's disappeared. It's gone. The Jews cannot ever go back to restore law keeping because the Ark of the Covenant, table of showbread, and the candlesticks have all disappeared. They're all gone, every one of them. Meanwhile, the Ark up in heaven is there and it's everlasting. That's, that's because the covenant that it's based on is everlasting. The one in heaven is the real Ark. The one on earth is just a shadow. A foreshadowing, a figure. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for opening our eyes a little bit. Teach us, Lord, some good things. Help us to learn the types, the foreshadows, the allegories, the pictures, the figures, the examples that you give us in Scripture. Father, especially the examples 
of the people in the Bible, these great people in the Bible that are just like us. They're men and women of like passions. They're men and women who sin. They're men and women who have trials and temptations, who are weak, and yet you chose them being weak so that your strength could be manifested in them and in us. So, Father, thank you for making them like us, us like them, and for choosing us and using us for your kingdom and your glory's sake. We love you and we love this book. We ask your blessings in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.